I'm Richard Price, and I'd like to talk about curing lights and light curing technique. Curing lights have become an essential part of today's modern dental practice. We use them in bonding, resins, cements, crowns, and orthodontics. There are many different lights to choose from on the market, but which is a good one to choose for your type of dental practice? One of the problems we face is that all these curing lights seem to produce an acceptably hard surface at the top of the restoration, but we can't tell if the bottom is soft. We certainly can't poke a wooden stick into the restoration to see if the bottom is soft. Here we can see an example of a tooth where the bottom of the restoration is noticeably soft. And we have the situation where it's hard at the top and soft at the bottom. No matter how good your bonding agent is, the restoration will fail. So which curing light do I choose? You need to think about the access. How, how easy is it to access the back teeth? This is important because if the curing light is at an angle, insufficient light will reach to the bottom of the restoration. This is especially important in the bottom of the proximal boxes where due to the shadowing effect, you may get insufficient light and therefore insufficient cure. As curing lights have become smaller, you'll notice that some curing lights have got very small light tips at the end of them. And while this increases the radiance, it unfortunately means that you have to use the lights many times to achieve the same coverage as the lights with the larger tip. Therefore, in most instances, I recommend using a curing light that has a wide tip and in addition, the tip should deliver a uniform irradiance across the entire tip so that there are no hot spots or cold spots of irradiance, since this would produce an unevenly cured resin restoration. It's important to make sure the light has been approved for use in your country. For example, does it have a CE mark or is it CSA and Health Canada approved for sale and use in Canada? Before light curing, first thing to do, of course, is to make sure the light is clean. So use the disinfectant recommended by the manufacturer to clean the light. Check to see if there's any damage or debris on the end of the light guide, and if there is, remove it. I recommend the use of infection control barriers over the curing light, and these should be snugly fitting. It's important to make sure you don't position the seam of the barrier across the end of the light tip. If you do put the seam over the tip, See how this affects the light beam uniformity at the end of the light tip. I strongly recommend checking the light output regularly, and I recommend keeping a room log of all the curing lights that you have in your practice. Depending on how busy your practice is, you may want to check the light every day or every week. There are many different dental radiometers on the market that you can choose from to test your light. Here we can see an example of the new Blue Phase Meter 2 that measures both the irradiance and the power output from the curing light. The light should deliver between 500 and 2000 milliwatts per centimeter squared in the standard mode. Some people believe in a concept called exposure reciprocity. Exposure reciprocity would mean that if you doubled the irradiance, then you could halve the curing time. But this doesn't happen, especially when the irradiance goes above 2000 milliwatts per centimeter squared. The danger is that some manufacturers have produced very high output curing lights in an attempt to reduce curing times. If you use these high output lights, it's important to make sure that you use them properly, otherwise they can burn the tissues. The light should be placed directly over the restoration and you should minimize exposure to the lips and gingiva. Blowing air over the soft tissues when light curing can help or else you can just have a five second pause between each light exposure. It's important to follow the instructions for use for the composite that you're using. Set the light to the correct exposure mode and exposure time. Having done all these things, it's important to now make sure that you use the curing light properly. If you don't watch what you're doing, it's very easy for the light to gradually wander further and further away from the restoration and you'll end up with an undercured resin at the bottom. So I recommend using appropriate eye protection and watching what you're doing so that you stay on target. You should position the tip close to the restoration and perpendicular directly above it. 
I also recommend using supplemental lateral exposures. These are especially important when light curing the resin in a class 2 proximal box. Be very careful when the distance between the tip and the restoration is more than 5 mm, or when there's an angle, because if there are angles, you'll get an inadequate cure. As you can see here on the right hand side, the composite resin in the distal box is not cured at all. So, in summary, I strongly recommend wearing eye protection, stabilize the tip over the restoration, and watch what you're doing when light curing. When you finish light curing, clean and disinfect the unit using the recommended disinfectant. And if your curing light has got vents in it, be very careful of spraying disinfectant into the vents because this is bound to affect the electronics. The take home message from this presentation is that light curing is important. You should monitor your curing light, read and understand and follow the instructions for use, pay attention when light curing, and use eye protection. I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me at rbprice.dal.ca. Thank you.